minor and minor soapy song. I'm not concerned about it. Let's begin. First of all, this is an immersion lecture <laughs> on the history of the motion picture industry coming to California, Los Angeles. And what you're going to see is how it all developed and ended up here in Culver City. Uh, it, well, not ended up. It was everywhere, as you're going to see in a minute. And you'll understand why this became the film capital of the world. As early as 1915, get this, in motion picture news, on the cover, Los Angeles, mecca of the motion picture. 1915, can you imagine that? So that's why this place, this Los Angeles, which was a sleepy town, as we all know, a rancho town. And uh, what is Poverty Row? See, that's the question. What is the definition of this? It means that these early companies that came here from the East Coast mostly, and Chicago, Many of them, except for a few, were poor companies. They were very poor. They didn't have enough money. And uh, thus, Poverty Row Studio. And that's what this is. Warner Brothers, Paramount, Universal, they all started as Poverty Row Studios, which we're going to get into. And it's all relating, and you're going to see really clearly, the development of Los Angeles as a, as a place, a city, and they, later Hollywood as, as the iconic name. And um, so why don't we just start? We'll start with this first shot. This is from an article in, the, in a magazine <clears throat> in about 19, I think it was around 1924, 25. This is uh, the side of Sunset Boulevard right by Gower Street. Now this building is still there. This building is still there. Uh, no, excuse me, this is now that restaurant building. The corner of Gower is right here. And this was the Horsley Laboratories. And we're going to get into Horsley, who he was. But Gower and Sunset is really more or less the birth of the m more modern film industry, because that's where all the little Poverty Row studios were located, on Beechwood Drive, Gordon Street, Sunset, Gower. And little by little, they started growing out of there, too. They were downtown and everywhere. So let's start our tour with the next slide. OK, thank you very much. Now, I put up here on all the slides, so you can see, I wrote a short caption. So everyone can look and study it. <laughs> now look at this shot. This is the very first studio, if you want to call it a studio, in Los Angeles. At, um, um, on Main Street between 7th and 8th. And uh, it was on top of the building. And this is the Selig Polyscope Company of Chicago that came here and filmed on the rooftop. And that's the director, Boggs. Uh, right there, who was the, really the first director in California. Next. This is the very first set built in Los Angeles on Olive Street between 7th and 8th in 1908 because they could not really film on the rooftop. I was at that rooftop. There's some skylights there. You saw there was, they built a stage on the skylight. How can you run around or do anything up there? You can't do anything. So they went down on the ground and rented a uh, drying yard at the Sing Key Laundry. Now, I, many people erroneously said it was the Sing, um, Sing something else laundry, Sing Z, Z Laundry. So I was past president of the LA City Historical Society for years, and we met at the LA, Hall of, uh, LA County Records, LA City Records downtown. And uh, so I decided to look up the uh, permit for the Sing Z Laundry, and found out the guy that wrote it, wrote it in a script, and it looks like Z, but it's actually Key, K-E-E. -E. So of course, I worked with the Chinese American Museum, the Japanese American Museum downtown. And when they found out that they, the Chinese community, had a part to play in the beginnings of the film industry, they were very excited, and now have a mention of it in their museum. So next shot. And this is another shot showing that set. Yes, that's a bedroom. Yes, they shot it outside, and look, people were new to movies, so when the wind blew, and the wind blew you know, everything around here, you know, people just suspended their you know, reactions to it and said, oh, this is wonderful. Sometimes there's a scene in a kitchen you know, with a tablecloth, the tablecloth's blowing like mad, you know, but they're inside the kitchen, of course. So that, what you're looking at now is the only few pictures that exist of this, 
And this is our, the beginnings of our heritage of Los Angeles film industry and, and, and Hollywood. Next. Now, the Seeler Company made a deal with Charles Lummis. Now, some of you know who that is. Charles Lummis was one of our first California historians. He helped start um, the first LA Public Library. He was the one that started the Southwest Museum and with all the Indian artifacts that were there. And he was the one that started the restoration of the missions of California. And so he made a deal with Colonel William Selig to pay a fee for a permit to film on rancho lands or on mission properties and that would help restore the missions. So the film industry early on at the very beginning had to do, again, real history and film history. And then what did they do? They did films about the rancho period. Ramona already was a very important story. You have to know the Ramona story if you're a Californio, like me. And that is the story Helen Hunt Jackson wrote that about, about the prejudice against the Native Americans at the time. And uh, it does not end well, but that ended up, of course, with the, uh, the Ramona pageant, which you, if you can ever get out there to Riverside to see it, it's well worth seeing. But it's Romeo and Juliet, basically. This is our early Rancho history life, which only ran about uh, 30 years or so until the, uh, the Mexican government took away um, in 1832 all of the, uh, 1834, all the Rancho properties and all and gave them to all of these Rancho people. So I was a kid actor in films and things and I was at Disney and I actually appeared in Zorro, a TV show. <laughs> So Zorro is this period, the period of the people against the Mexican government, or the Spanish government, excuse me, I have to get this straight, the Spanish government, because remember uh, <laughs> that it was the Spanish rule at the time that they were re revolting, and that's why Mexico to be, it was the revolution against uh, Spain. So the reason that this is, this is the Selig studio, and because of Charles Lummis, they designed the studio as the, as the um, um, San Gabriel mission. So this is the San Diego mission. I mean, they took all the elements. The second film company to come to Los Angeles in 1909, first was Selig, second was the Bison Film Company. This was a company in New York, uh, headed by Charles Bauman and uh, Adam Kessel, New York Motion Picture Film Company. They had a novel idea. Why don't we have real Indians in our films that will write, star, and uh, produce their own films? So they formed the Bison Company and got Red Wing, who's a real um, Sioux Indian uh, woman who would, with her husband, James Young there. <coughs> and they did, um, uh, they were on vaudeville doing all kinds of things. She did all the original beadwork, beautiful work. And um, eventually the New York Motion Picture Film Company signed them and they started their films. Next. And there they are. This is, I put all their names on this particular shot because uh, it was very important, but that's Red Wing here, that's James Young Deer. There is Charles Bauman. This is Fred Bell Schofer. Be Fred Bell Schofer was a actor, director in New York on, on the stage, eventually went into films and was a manager and later became a director all the way into the 1930s and then be became a character actor all the way into the 50s. Amazing life. So he set up the studio here in Edendale which is where the Selig studio was, which you just saw. Edendale is off of Glendale Boulevard where the two freeway comes down on the way to Echo Park. So that's where all the movie studios were first in LA. I did a big major article in 1980 for the LA Times called Hollywood Before Hollywood, Edendale, the star of Hollywood. So anyway, um, B.B. Daniels is in here, Art Accord is right there. He's, we could consider him one of the very first film cowboy stars which we will look at in a minute. Next. This is the studio they went to. They went into Edendale, which was horse ranches at the time. Now, in 19, uh, about 1901, a family called the Hornbecks opened up their little horse ranch on Alessandro Boulevard. Alessandro Boulevard, after Ramona. Alessandro, see? The culture was very important because of Helen Hunt Jackson and Ramona, people came from around the world to find Ramona's birthplace, even though she's a fictional character. <laughs> and they went to Rancho Camulos looking for her grave and, uh, and, and the uh, mission of San Capistrano where they had action there. They went down there looking for Ramona. You know, but that's how vivid she wrote this character. So it became part of California culture. You know, they did uh, th th 
for Ramona Films, one in 1910 for the Biograph Company at Rancho Camulos with Mary Pickford. They did the next one, 1915, for the Clone Company, which we're going to cover in a minute. And uh, they did that one also at Rancho Camulos and uh, in Hollywood. The third one was for the for the Inspiration Pictures with Dolores Del Rio in 1928. And then the Fox one with Don Amici and Loretta Young. Isn't that something? All Ramona films. And the, and the Ramona pageant was going strong. I'm telling you, this is California culture. So this little horse ranch, the Hornbeck Ranch, uh, this picture came from William Hornbeck, who I knew very well. He was a famous film editor. And how did he get his start? Next shot. He got his start working at the Bison Film Company at sweeping the floors of the editing rooms as a kid. And, he, and his mother, in 1905, I think, a, a wandering photographer was wandering around, shot pictures of their whole property from the hill, looking down, everything, in 1905. And she bought one, of those, a couple of those pictures, a dollar and a half, that was a lot of money. And he gave those to me. It's the only shots that early of all of Edendale, thanks to William Hornbeck, who's no longer with us. This is the Bison Film Company. This is Red Wing, James Young Deer. And um, this is when they came to the West Coast. Before that, they were making their films on Staten Island and in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Now I have to plug that. I'm involved nationally <laughs> with all this subject. We have just opened a brand new museum called the Barrymore Film Center in Fort Lee, New Jersey. That is right at the other side of the Wa George Washington Bridge. That's where all the studios were when they came off of Manhattan. That's the Biograph, Vitagraph, Edison, and then others that came to Fort Lee because it would look like you know, the rural areas where they did their westerns. The Great Train Robbery was shot in New Jersey as well, 1903, by, Ed by Edison. So anyway, these are the first Native Americans in films. Next. And these are different typical scenes. And the scenes have to do with two Indians, for example, coming into a bar. Like, what are you doing here? Right? You're not allowed to be. And that's the storylines of all of this. And how, of course, James Young there is the star. Look at what his vest. It's a hand-beaded vest that she made. She was incredible. Next. Now we get into the beginning of the B Westerns. And this is what I did in Lone Pine is that the beginning of B-Westerns, a B-Western means when you have a feature film, this started in the 1940s, right, right before, at, before the war, right after the war, is that you see a feature film, but they need to show you something other than a cartoon. So they had a small feature film, usually a Western, a B-Western, right? Of course, some of them were C and F Westerns, but we won't go there. <laughs> All right, so anyway, this is Art Corps the first real cowboy star, 1909. Can you imagine how early this is? And that is Snowball the Horse that Fred Balshofer bought. He was a stallion. And he thought, we're going to star a horse for the first time in films. And they did. They starred Snowball in these films, and, um, which led to the white horses being in films, like Hopalong Cassidy, Silver, of course. And we have um, uh, Lone Ranger. And we have many, many other white horses. I, ha I have about t 14 white horse stars uh, all through the years. And I made a whole list. I did a whole chart of what colors they were. Now, Roy Rogers and others had palominos and other kind of horses of beautiful coloring. Uh, and Randolph Scott has this most gorgeous horse, which is like a deep copper color with a beautiful yellowish mane. I mean, gosh, a horse should have been a model. <laughs> Next one. So now Ella, Evelyn Graham was the first bison female star. And Lone Pine connects to all this, because in 1909, it was, the, it was the bison film company that went up to Lone Pine. They were the first company to film in Lone Pine, which is the Owens Valley, which if you know where that is, that's Mount Whitney on the way to Mammoth, on the way up to Reno and all this way, the Highway 395. OK, Evelyn Graham, of course, is standing on Snowball. Next. In Film Fancies magazine in 1911 was touting the Bison Film Company and their stars. And we have her John Milton Brown, Art Acord, Bertha Blanchett, and Del Blanchett. Del and Bertha were real, she was a real cowgirl, he was a real cowboy, and they were featured in these films. Next. Now we have the Bison Film Company site being taken over by 
another company that the New York Motion Picture Film Company had called the Keystone Film Company. That's the comedy company. They came from New York in 1912. The Bison Company was moved all the way to Santa Monica to where we now today is San Inez Canyon, which is Sunset Boulevard and Pacific Coast Highway. This is what it became. It became the famous Keystone Studio. On, they changed the name to Glendale Boulevard from Alessandro Street. Next. And that's the original entrance way as you go in. And look at this. The guy is holding the guy's arm. He says, where are you going? <laughs> well, I have to see so-and-so. This is really early on. The studios had their police. They had their security, everything as far back as this time because people can't just wander in into the film studio and wander around the set. So this is the earliest days of this. Next. Now this is a really rare shot. I have to have this cleaned and fixed, but that, yes, that's Charlie Chaplin and Mabel Normand. They were the two, one of those top stars of Keystone at that time. In 1913, look at how early, again. Now Mabel Norman, which you just saw for a moment, I just have to say something about her. She was one of the earliest comedic stars in films. She came from, of course, the stage, like many of them did. Charlie Chaplin came from the English Music Hall and others from vaudeville. That's what slapstick is all about. It had to do with slapsticking, you know, like when you hit somebody, it's a giant sound and scares everyone. That's slapstick. Clowns had slapstick shoes. When they walk around, they slap at their shoes. I hate clowns, but never mind. <laughs> so anyway, um, there is Max Sennett. Max Sennett was an actor, a comedic actor with the Biograph Company with Mabel Norman. So in other words, the Bauman, Charles Bauman and Kessel of the New York Motion Picture Company stole from Biograph all their comedic stars and directors. Next. They also have Teddy the Dog. And there's Teddy the dog, and guess who's standing next to Teddy the dog? Gloria Swanson. Gloria was a Max Sennett comedy girl, and she was only, I think she was four, nine, or five feet, I think. And she's as tall, she's taller than a Teddy, but, but not much. Next. Now, soon after the Bison Film Company was already established by 1910, the Pathé of America Company purchased the contract from them of James Youngdeer. And that's James Youngdeer right there. And Red Wing is, oh, you can't see her, but that's her, her head right there. And Red Wing, they were both uh, went over to Pathé in Edendale. And this is the Pathé studio in Edendale. And they all designed their studios, look, as the missions. See, the whole idea of the culture of Los Angeles at the time was mission culture. In other words, it's Spanish, Mexican culture. And of course, all the names were Spanish, everything. I mean, this was Spanish territory, Mexican territory for years. So they, but they, the mission, the ranchos were romantic at this time. Ramona's story is a romantic story. So everything, you know, all their films, there was a Monrovia film company in 1915. What did they do? Films about rancho life and the Dons fighting against the Spanish and the Mexicans. I mean, it's constant going on. Next. That is James Youngdeer in his actual, you know, uh, his uh, headdress, etc. You can see, you get a good look at him. He, in 1926, he did a feature film about the uh, Osage murders. Does that seem familiar to you, everyone? Wow. Right? Well, he did it in 1926. The film is lost. Of course, Scorsese didn't mention that it was James Younger that actually brought it to the attention of everyone and did a film about it. But anyway, uh, let's, uh, let's forget that for now. Okay, next. Now, oh yeah, that's James Young there there, and there is Red Wing right there for the uh, Pathé West Coast Studio. And these are all the other actors here. They did westerns, of course. Everybody did westerns, next. Now, I actually, in my book, I did an incredible map, which nobody ever thought could be done. <laughs> it took me a long time and a lot of help. But this is Edendale Studios. Look at all of them. From, uh, I have from, uh, 1910, all the way up into the about 1940 or something. And this was Hollywood before Hollywood was Edendale. So we have Fort Lee, New Jersey, Hollywood before Hollywood. They all came here to LA, downtown, which you're gonna see in a minute. And then Edendale was a concentration and eventually they all moved slowly into Hollywood and concentrated in Hollywood. Next. The first company to come to Los Angeles, I mean to Hollywood, excuse me, was the Nestor Film Company, 1911. 
Remember these dates, 1911. Can you imagine? It's way over 100 years ago. Can you imagine? So this is David Horsley and William Horsley. They were Englishmen who were living in Bayonne, New Jersey at the time. They had a pool hall, and uh, they started showing Edison movies in the pool hall so people can see movies in there. And they decided they're going to uh, make films. And so that's, they started the Centaur Film Company in New Jersey and uh, eventually changed the name to Nestor and came out here. Nestor is the name of, of uh, David Horsley's son, Nestor Stanley Horsley. And uh, they came out to Los Angeles, and everybody said you should go to this little village of Hollywood. I mean, it's a perfect place where you could get cheap land, cheap everything. People say that all these companies came out because of Edison Patents Company wars. Yeah, there were some going on, but uh, most of the time they came out for the sun, cheap land, cheap labor, and it's the West. That's why they came out. Next. So they went out and started doing Westerns, okay? And they hired everybody they could think of who, who could ride a horse. And um, this is just part of a panorama. This is a giant, long panorama. I counted 15 cowgirl stars and about 20 um, cowboy stars. I call them stars because many of them came from the Wild West shows. They were stars, you know, equestrian stars, shooting, you know, riding, trick riding and all this. And I just met with uh, the families yes, uh, Sunday at the, at the Russian church in East Hollywood on Mitchell Torina Street, which has been there since 1922. And the, many of these Russians were in the early films. Well, get this, since 1880s, there were real uh, Cossacks, Russian Cossack writers with the Buffalo Bill Wild West show. And so some guy wrote a whole giant book on it. So I'm, I'm working on now on identifying. And they were in all kinds of films throughout the film industry, real Cossacks who, who fought during the revolution or pre-revolution. So that's David Horsley right there. That's Al Christie. He's one of the very first directors in Hollywood who directed comedies and later took over the Nestor studio. Next. Now, Nestor Company in 1911 was taken over by the newly formed Universal Pictures, Motion Picture Manufacturing Company, who started in 1912. They were not a manufacturing company yet. They were a company that would, that would release the films of independence. So the Nestor Company was an independent. And uh, there were a whole bunch of independent ones that joined Universal. But by the end of 1912, Carl Lemley, the head of the Imp Company, the Independent Motion Picture Corporation, he took over and he dropped all of the other little companies like Nestor, which became Universal Film Manufacturing Company. And they started immediately to make their films, Universal Films, at Gower and Sunset, the beginning of Poverty Row, which I just showed you earlier. So this is the first studio built in Hollywood by the Nestor Company with Universal Release. This is the North, northwest corner of Gower and Sunset. So this is Sunset and Gower right here. This is Columbia Square today. Okay, next. Al Christie eventually took over everything. Uh, David Horsley went on to open um, two other studios, which we're gonna get to in a minute. And, but Al Christie became the Christie Film Company, making comedies just like Max Sennett. Now, Max Sennett and Al Christie were really good friends, so the kind of Christie comedies were different than the Keystones, later the Max Sennett comedies. And later on, we'll get to the formation of Studio City, which they, they created. Bye. Next. This is postcards. Yes, they had early postcards of, for the tourism coming. Yes, they had tourists all the way back to... I'll tell you when, about, about 1890s. The first tourist attraction in Hollywood was the Paul de Longpre house. Paul de Longpre was a French painter who painted flower paintings. And uh, to this day, if you can find a de Longpre painting, that's like $5,000, still very important painter. So he built a giant house at the northwest corner of Wilcox and Hollywood Boulevard. Gorgeous, I'm not showing it in this show. That's another show on Hollywood, okay? But um, people, they had actual, uh, downtown LA had actual buses, tourist buses. They would take them up there and they would have lunch, a box lunch in his beautiful gardens. And then they would go in the house and see it, a tour of the house, and maybe buy a painting. Next. This is Al Christie directing 
open stages because in those days, yes, they had lighting on the East Coast, but they didn't need too much lighting here. They, they had open stages with diffusers. These are muslin diffusers, which diffuse the light, so any cameraman like Mark Morris in the back would understand that it diffuses the light on your face so you don't have shadows. I mean, wow, what a cheap way of getting away with it, right? Next. Now look at this, this is an incredible shot. 1922, this is Sunset and Gower right here. Okay, this is now um, Denny's. And this is Columbia Square. And right over here, see this mess over here in this big building? That is the Paramount Laboratory, Deluxe Labs, as it later became. And Amatron was in here, remember Amatron, the electronic place? And all of this was famous players Lasky, Paramount Studio, which moved, which we'll get to, uh, to where Paramount is today on, on Melrose Avenue, but we'll get there later. Next. There's Columbia Square. There you go. This is a great shot showing the, the early days of when Universal first was in Hollywood, and then they had to leave Hollywood to go to their ranch. They leased the old Providencia Rancho. Here we go, Rancho history again. Providencia Rancho is now where the Forest Lawn is today. And um, of course, Lawn Hollywood Hills, excuse me, across from Warner Brothers. And um, uh, that was later called the Lasky Ranch, but it was first called the Bison Ranch. Why? Because the Bison Film Company used it because why? It's the real West. A Poverty Row director came to the producer and said, we have to shoot uh, some Western scenes you know, up in Lone Pine or somewhere, you know, far away. He says, no, 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 we don't have the money for that. Shoot in Griffith Park. A tree is a tree, a rock is a rock. Shoot it in Griffith Park. <laughs> and, and in a way, that's true. So anyway, so it shows us. This later became the comedy unit of Universal called the Century Comedies and LKO Comedies. We'll get to that next. This is the back lot of Century Comedies, which you just saw. You just saw that building. And this is the early back lots, but in the early 20s of what it was like. Flats here, little New York Street. This is open stages right here. So Universal started here and sort of moved out to the ranch. They called it the Oak Crest Ranch, which was uh, where Forest Lawn is. And we're going to get to how that changed. Next. This is how they shoot these films. Look at the diffusers up here. They had water scenes in here. These are bathing beauties wearing very, uh, I would say, for that time, in the teens, showing their legs, that is very, you know, what's the word? Risque, thank you, thank you. Next. Look at this, isn't this interesting? Now, Jerry Lewis did this in one of his pictures. In the Jerry Lewis picture, built a set like this at Paramount. And basically, they have different scenes, and they would actually follow them walking up the stairs, going into rooms, and it, it would be this real expose, like a third wall that's missing that you would see. Next. Now, look at what I found. I mean, look at this. The other universal releasing company was called LKO Pictures, Learman Knockout Pictures. Henry Learman was a very important uh, comedic star at Keystone, later had his own companies, and actually opened up the first comedy company in Culver City called the Learman Studios, which later became the Hal Roach Studios, okay? We'll get to that. But anyway, in this letter, and you can see the address, 6100 Sunset Boulevard, that's what you were just looking at, and it says, Archie Mayo was a famous Warner director, but we're going back to 1918. Archie Mayo, who was in our employ for over a year, started with our company in the scenario department and finding his work most satisfactory, we advanced him until he became a director. Mr. Mayo director directed several pictures for us and each one came up to our expectations. We are glad to say that Archie Mayo is a man of excellent habits is honest and industrious. He left us to join the colors, whatever that means, I don't know. But this is, uh, that Julius Stern was the head of the company at the time. And the, the, the Sterns were part of the beginning of Universal. I will get to that next. This is the Poverty Row. This is the birth of Hollywood pictures. This is Gower and Sunset right here. So anyway, this is what Horsley built. David Horsley left the Nestor Company. Al Christie took over, became Christie Comedies, and he built the Horsley Studios Laboratories right here. And he built this studio here where cereals were made. Francis Ford, John Ford's brother, made cereals for Universal. And uh, 
You can see Hollywood was still citrus groves at this time. Next. Look, with, look at this. This is Poverty Row map. And this is crazy. Look at all these studios. Look at all the dates. Look, they changed over. This is Gower, Beechwood, and Gordon Street. My gosh, 1915 to 1944. Now you understand how the industry was born here? I mean, wow. When you look at it like this, it's just, oh my gosh, how do you keep track? Don't ask me. I've been doing this 50 years now since I was five. <laughs> learning, learning, <laughs> learning how to, to figure this out in my head and mapping it out was very difficult. Next. Now this is the, the drawing when Horsley was deciding he's going to build his new studio complex here at Poverty Row, Gower, Sunset, right here. There's the gas station right there. And it, the laboratories later became Hollywood Film Enterprises, which all of us film students, I guess I was a film student too, I was a theater major, music major, but I was uh, also a film student. I was at the American Film Institute. This is where you get your 16 millimeter films uh, developed until recent times, till they moved out to the valley and disappeared. Um, but now this is all going to be developed. I'm with Hollywood Heritage, LA Conservancy. We are trying to save the studios, what's left of them, because with the, with the um, Hackman properties and Hudson properties taking over all these studios, changing them, removing them, we're trying to save what's left of the historic fabric of all these studios. So thank goodness we saved the, uh, you know, the Culver Studio front, the Thomas Ince, uh, you know, administration building, you know, the, uh, on Washington Boulevard. I mean, otherwise, that would have been gone by now. And Julie Lugo Serra, who's right here next to me. Right, Julie? Well, I've known Julie forever, and of course, oh, by the way, talk about the Pueblo. The Lugo House was right on the plaza, along with the other important families of the, of the uh, Mexican period, of the Rancho period. And of course, the Lugo uh, Rancho was part here in Bell, and downtown. So the Lugo family, along with all the others, were part of these early days, and of course, all connected somehow to the film industry. Next. That's what it became. This is Beechwood Drive and Sunset, and there's the Horsley Studios. Burston is one of these little independent Poverty Row studios that rented space, and the laboratories handle all of their laboratory needs. Next. Look at this. This is a different angle looking east. This, the independent studio, which was the Horsley lot, you see called Waldorf. Waldorf was one of the branches of the CBC, Cone, Brandt Cone, which we'll get to, which is the beginnings of Columbia Pictures. Next. Independent studios of Jesse Goldberg, same building. Poverty Row, different companies. Next. This is uh, the other side of Beechwood Drive that Horsley built. This later became the Francis Ford Studio for Universal Release. They did serials. And then this was where the Stern Brothers ended up because the Century LKO Studio that we just saw burned down in 1926 in a giant fire. So when I met the owner of Gower Gulf Shopping Center, years ago when he was putting it in. He said we were digging, he wanted to ask me a question. He says, we find this, this dark ashen black soil everywhere because the studio burned. He said, I had no idea the studio burned there. So he renamed his whole thing Gower Gulch Shopping Center and built a western town there in honor of the westerns. Next. What was done by the Stern brothers over there? Well, the Stearns and the Alexanders uh, through marriage, all related. Uh, they did the Buster Brown series, there's Buster Brown, and that is Max Alexander, who was the production manager for the Stern Alexander Productions. Next. This is, they did, they did these comedies. Now we know, you know, uh, Norman Lear comedies, we know about uh, all these comedy shows, you know, All in the Family and all this stuff. All was started by the Alexander brothers and the Stearns. They didn't have TV. They were all shown in the theaters as a B, instead of a B Western, you have a B comedy, TV situation comedy. Next. Now here they are. That's Jack Cohn, I mean, excuse me, Harry Cohn and Jack Cohn and the director uh, Gilstrom. That is the beginning of the Wilnat, which is the beginning of Columbia Pictures. Columbia Pictures was formed by little independent studios that that Harry Cohn and his brother Jack started. 
And they started these little companies and eventually merged them into Columbia Pictures. And what did they do? They bought every independent studio at Gower and Sunset, every building, every company, merging it all in, which became Columbia, which we will see in a minute. Next. This is on Gower Street. Look at the, all these studios here. Bischoff Studios, H.G. Whitwer Comedies, Gold Medal Comedies, Biff Thrill Comedies. What was all this? These were all, um, these were all comic strips. Most of them were whole room boy comedies were all comic strips that were so popular they made the films. Like Marvel, okay, this is your perfect example. Marvel comic books. We see now Superman and all this other stuff coming out. This exact same thing then. So instead of Marvel, it is Whitmer comedies or wh whatever, gold medal. It was all the same thing. Next. This is how Columbia eventually took over. They took over all those studios. This is looking down Gower Street, right? Sunset's right here. And you can see how they were advertising this. This building is still here. All this was moved, a, a, a new building here. And this stage is still there. Some of those stages are still there. Yes, I've worked with all the studios all these years, again, since I was five, and uh, on many committees to try to save our film heritage. Next. Now remember, where did the name Gower Gulch come from? Came from the Gower Gulch Cowboys, these guys. Where are they standing on the corner of Gower and Sunset? What is this over here? Is the Columbia Drugs in Fountain. They had a bank of, I think there were six telephone booths in there, and the fountain. And I met all the guys from CBS News in there. They would went in there, and I interviewed them all about television history of Los Angeles and Hollywood, and radio history, of course, very important. Because I formed Bison Archives from where, everybody? The Bison Film Company, of course. And so what did I do? I worked in all the research libraries at the studios in the 80s and 90s. And all my bosses said, you know, the studios are getting rid of the research libraries. Why don't you form your own research library, which I did, Bison, which covers the history of filmmaking. No, first of all, the history of Los Angeles, California, and the film industry and how it all intertwines. That's my specialty. And everything I do, all the books I do, everything always has film history. My newest book has just come out. And that is Hollywood on the Santa Monica Beach. It's an Arcadia book. And I just did my fir first book signing in one of the, in the Samuel Goldwyn Beach House, right on the Santa Monica Beach, on the North Beach, north of, of course, uh, Santa Monica Pier. And that's where the Marion Davies and Hearst Beach House is, the Annenberg today. Beachwood Drive Studios, more old studios here. Western Pictures, 1934. So when I was one of the founders of Filmex, the Los Angeles International Film Exposition in 1971, when I was, what, 15. And um, uh, my first office, Columbia Studios had moved off the lot in 1970. And I was at the American Film Institute and I personally, I give myself credit, saved the Columbia Photo Collection, which was thrown away was going to be thrown away, and I saved it. 800,000 photos, can you imagine? So that was a whole archives, which is now at the Sony Archives. We saved it there now, it's all beautiful. But I didn't know this, but the research library was being thrown away at the same time, I wasn't aware. But guess what, I just found 30 file cabinets of location photos from Columbia Pictures that, that an art director saved and hid them until recently. Nobody's seen them, I just went to go see them. I'm now working at Fox Studio, now creating new archives and a tour there. And so they're going to uh, store it for me so I can see what's in it. But I can tell you one thing that's in it. I pulled out the card from the Columbia Location Department card. And, it's, and it's, it had a history of everything of the Chatsworth uh, train station. And it was taken in 1929, so exteriors, interiors, in beautiful shots. So can you imagine what's in those files? I'm hoping there's other plazas in there. I'm hoping. There's, there are uh, historical pictures in the location departments that nobody's ever seen, never been published. Part of Bison Archives, because I worked at all the studios, you can imagine, a third of Bison is history of location filmmaking in California and other states as well, but California particularly, and Los Angeles. Next. Next, early Poverty Row Company, Warner Brothers. 
They started with Nickelodeons in the East Coast, came out, were making these productions just like Harry Cohn. The same thing, Jack Warner was like Harry Cohn, like they're brothers. And the other brothers, just like Harry Cohn's brother, all got involved in exposition of films and rental of films, got into film production. This is in the middle of a field at Bronson and Sunset Boulevard. Today, the KTLA studio. Today, it's called the Bron Sunset Bronson Studio of Hudson Properties. Next. And they finally built this in 1923, this beautiful facade, just like we have here on Washington Boulevard, the George Washington Thomas Ince uh, Administration Building. They built their own classical building right on Sunset, which is now protected as well. That's still there. So when you go by, admire it, because it is the most beautiful building. But remember, studios were film factories. So when you go behind the, the Culver Studio, the beautiful facade, and you're in a film factory. Same thing here. You go behind that, it's a film factory. Next, they, they are the ones, the Warner Brothers were the first to get into radio, and this is the KFWB mobile unit, and that was, KFWB was, of course, uh, the Warner Brothers, and um, like KFWB, I forgot the call letters, but WB is Warner Brothers, I'll tell you that. Next, this is it at Sunset, Van Ness, and Bronson. There's the towers for KFWB, and when they built the Warner Theater on Hollywood Boulevard at Wilcox, right across from the Paul de Longpre house, I might ask, uh, they put the two giant towers there as well, because the KFWB had a station right next door. And I was a musician. We used, to, our, we used to bring in our demos. Yes, we could walk right into KFWB, and they would play our demo. God, those days are ancient days. Jeez. OK, anyway, next. Now we get to. The Lasky Ranch, remember? The Providencia Rancho. This is the Providencia Rancho in 1913. Looking north, that's the San Fernando Valley. That's Burbank right over here. And this is the rancho. It was 2,200 acres, something like that. Remember, it's Forest Lawn, and it's also the uh, Mount Sinai. So it's all of that. So anyway, this is was the real west. This is where the Bison Film Company went to film their films. Can you imagine? This was un interrupted country and valleys and everything you need for the real west. That's where they went. That's why it was later called the Lasky Ranch. Next. Now, right near it, this is, well, back to the Lasky Ranch. That's where Universal went. That's the Oak Crest Ranch, the Providencia Rancho. So they were there from 1912, and they had a big opening ceremony. Universal was not Universal City yet. The next year, 1913, was the formation, August, of Universal City, okay? They had to, it was really not an incorporated city, it was North Hollywood was the real city, but it was a publicity city. They needed a mayor and all this. The first mayor was Lois Weber. She was one of the first important directors in Hollywood. And um, the a police chief, they needed a real police chief that had to be accredited with the LA, uh, LAPD and the LA County Sheriff. And th that she was elected was, was um, was uh, Oakley, uh, Laura Oakley. Who was Laura Oakley? She was a, uh, what do you call it, uh, opera singer. She was six foot two. It turns out she was the first police woman in the United States, a real police woman. And Alice Stebbins Wells was the first police woman in the whole United States, which trained her in 1913. Interesting history of police, fire, women in film, it's all connected, like is something new, women in film? They, they seem to make it that way. But now there's many more women in film, but there were a lot of women in film for, at different periods of time in, throughout film history. Now, let's move, oh yeah, so excuse me, go back, I'm sorry. So this is Lancashire Boulevard, and Campo de Cuenca is right in that empty field right there. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the ruins. They, the ruins, we think, were completely gone by about 1908. I don't have any shots yet. I'm looking for them. So that's Ventura Boulevard right there. And this today is Studio City. And this is the beginning of Universal. Why, did they, why are they at Lancashire? I just told you they were at the Oak Crest Ranch. Because in 1912 to 1914, two years, they, th they thrived there at the Oak Crest Ranch, but they wanted to buy the ranch. Nobody would sell it. The, whoever owned it, a whole bunch of ranches who owned it wouldn't sell it. So they moved over in 1914 to here, which it, where it is today. 
So off of Barham Boulevard, right on the other side of Barham, so that all became Forest Lawn and all that in later years. First, the Lasky Ranch and all this business. So this is the third opening. First one, 1912, 1913, and 1915. March 14, 1915. They opened here and they had an aerial um, demonstration with planes because the film industry, I did a book on aviation in Hollywood too, of course. So as early on with 1903 to 1906 with the Wright brothers, believe it or not, they were being filmed already by Hollywood. Well, not Hollywood, but being filmed, I'll put it that way. So they had a demonstration, and uh, Frank Stites was the aerial man. Uh, uh, Carl Lemley, who headed the company, so he sat on the wing, and they took pictures, you know, while the, f while the engine's warming up. And then, they, he took, then Frank Stites took up a dummy plane with him, filled with explosives, and they, it blew up, you know, and everything was great. 10,000 people were there. And get a, a shock wave hit his plane, knocked him off balance, and he crashed, and he was killed in front of all 10,000 people on the opening day of Universal. And guess what? Mark here has photographs of it, including his body on the ground. I know, I'm sorry to say it. Next. Yes, that's snow, everybody. Because before the infrastructure of Los Angeles, the heat from LA came up. We had snow everywhere. We had snow in Beverly Hills, where I am from, and snow in Hollywood, snow everywhere. And then, of course, the little by little snow in the valley. And now, once in a while, maybe you get some in Porter Ranch or Chatsworth. I don't even know anymore if there's snow anymore there. This is the same shot. This is the Barham Pass right here, Mount Hollywood and later Warner Brothers, the, the Providencia Rancho, right on the other side there. Look at the back lot of Universal. Isn't that incredible? What a giant property they got. Well, next. They did all kinds of westerns, films, uh, but they did 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea there in 1913 as well. But this is the westerns. The westerns was the staple, and this is the Harry Carey unit. Next. And yes, they had the first studio tours in 1915. And this is the studio tour. It says, Visitor's Observation Platform. So you could look down on the open stages below you and yell out to your favorite star, go get him, Harry. <laughs> and nobody cared, right? Yeah, it was silent movies, right? Next. <laughs> they don't do that anymore. Next. Look at this. I found this color original plot plan of Universal early on, 1918. And this is Lancashire Boulevard. Campo Tricoengo would be right here. And uh, there's the studio infrastructure. Then there was a hill right here separating the back lot that you just saw and the Los Angeles River. The Los Angeles River used to have water in it a lot. <laughs> and, uh, but then again, when it didn't have water in it, that's why Laura Oakley was made police chief. Why did they need police? Because the city uh, council of LA at the time, the LAPD and the LA County Sheriff were always um, needing to patrol the river there. Why? There was homeless living in the river, dead bodies, people were using the river as a toilet, there was all kinds of uh, horrible things going on there, people, there was stolen things there, so they had to regulate the river, they had to watch over it, so Universal, because they were city now, had to do this, so they had a horse patrol. So I have pictures of, uh, of, of uh, Laura Oakley and her horse patrol, and let me tell you, that horse had to be big for her, because she was big. Next. This is the front on Lancashire Boulevard, the truck gate, 1916. Next. Now we get into Hollywood again, and we get to the other studios. This is on Gower Street right here. Melrose is right over here. We have the first studios there. This is the Robertson Cole FBO, Film Booking Offices Studio, opened up there in 1919, 1920. This is looking east toward the Brunton United Studios. Look at all the sets in here. By this, by, this is 1926, so look, this was all built up next. It later became Archeo Studios. This is Gower and Melrose. This is Archeo right here. Paramount, later became Paramount, which I will get to right next door. Next. Now we get to Hollywood Heritage. Hollywood Heritage. Brian Cooper's here. And so. Brian is one of our important people at Hollywood Heritage. I'm giving you an important designation of being an important person, <laughs> Brian. Thank you, Mark. You're important, too. Thank you. <laughs> we all have to share our importance, you know, somehow. <laughs> no, but he is, and we are important. Why? Because we're 
there's few of us doing this. We have to keep doing this, otherwise it'll totally be forgotten. That's why all of you, thank you for all you coming, because without us, none of this will exist, right? So anyway, this is the, this is the Lasky DeMille barn. It was the Jacob Stern barn originally at Selma and Vine. This is Vine, and this is Selma right here. It was a 1901, right? 1901 horse barn at Selma. And early on, 1912, some entrepreneurs came there and made it into a movie studio with a laboratory. And when the Lasky Feature Play Company came, which we'll see in a minute, in 1913, they took it over and later made it the birthplace of Paramount. Next. This is the first day of shooting for the Lasky Feature Play Company. Came from New York. Remember, they're all from New York and Chicago, mostly New York. And this is the first day of shooting at uh, the studio. That's, uh, and um, uh, this is um, Dustin Farnham, dressed as an Englishman. That's the story, is the English story. And um, uh, that's the open stage. And uh, they started making the Squaw Man. The Squaw Man was a famous stage play at the time, very important. Again, like Ramona, same thing about Indians, about white people, how they marry and how they're rejected, and all this kind of thing. And because uh, a lot of this was going on, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, sympathy for the American Indians, for black people at the time. You would not know it today. They don't say it, but there was plenty of it going on. So that's what this whole story was, and it was a sensation because the Indian woman played by Red Wing, remember Red Wing from our company? She was starring in this. And Noble Johnson, one of our first uh, black stars in Hollywood, which we're going to get to him in a minute. He started his own film company. He was one of the Indians in this whole thing. Next. This is the back of the barn. The, they, op they had an open stage with diffusers. This is them filming The Virginian, which was right after The Squaw Man, 1914. Next. This is how they got around. Now, they shot a lot on location. Why? It's cheaper, of course. And they needed the West. So where did they go? They, they contracted with the, the, uh, the sun, ro they call the Roscoe Gravel um, Pits, which is today Sun Valley, because it's all still gravel um, yards there. And they had spurs of, uh, of narrow gauge trains taking the gravel out. They also took gravel out of Griffith Park. Remember Bronson Canyon is a gravel pit uh, uh, there. And, but uh, they rented that out there, and they filmed, They built a, uh, a saloon right on the railroad tracks. DeMille talks about it in his, his notes. I worked for the DeMille Foundation for 40 years, so I have his notes and uh, all of his details. So this is the truck they went on. And so what they did was um, they put a lot of their equipment on the newly established Pacific Electric Trolley on, on Hollywood Boulevard in 1913 because that's when the first trolley went through Coinga Pass, 1913, out to the valley, to Universal. And they put their equipment on there and it went to uh, Chatsworth Station, which was both regular railroad and narrow gauge. And they would transfer to a real train, which take them up to Roscoe, to Sun Valley. They would unload there and film all in that area there, near the uh, mouth of the, the river, the uh, Little Tahunga River, thank you. Next. This is back of the barn, taken from the roof of the barn, showing their open stages. This is Selma Street going east, and this is El Centro right over here, and that's their first glass stage they built. And look at this shot. This is 1920. This is Vine and Sunset. Look how the studio grew. There's the barn right there. Bang. Look how they grew here, and then they took over this whole lot here, built back lot. And there's the Christie Nestor studio right down the block. Pretty neat, huh? And there is the Jacob Stern estate, which is where all this was. And there's early Hollywood and Coinga Pass right up here somewhere. Next. Now, in East Hollywood, as early as 1912, the Lubin Film Company came from Philadelphia. Remember, they came from New York, Philadelphia, and Chicago, basically, and Florida. And the Lubin Company shared this space with the SNA, SNA Film Company of Chicago. And this is the SNA Western Unit. That is Buck Taylor. He was the lookalike for Buffalo Bill. And there is Jane Bernudi, who I, my new discovery of one of the Miller Brothers 101 Wild West Show Cowgirls, who later joined the, joined the Thomas Ince, Inceville Cowgirls, and later joined SNA Lubin. 
and other companies. God, she was busy. Next. On the same site, later became the Charles Ray Studio. Today, KCET, but actually today, <coughs> the Scientology Media Center is there. But before you groan, <coughs> I'm the only liaison between Scientology and Hollywood because Scientology owns some of our greatest Hollywood landmarks all up and down Hollywood Boulevard and everywhere, including the studio. And they, no matter what you think, they are the best stewards of their properties. They restored this studio, the KCET studio, I'm telling you, incredible restoration. This is an aerial shot of East Hollywood Studios. There is the Charles Ray Lubin studio that you just saw. And now we're going to get to the fine art studio right across the street. All right, next. Now, this is the fine art studio at the corner of Virgil and Sunset Boulevard. It's the Vaughn's Market today. OK, you know it? And this is where D.W. Griffith was, Kinema Color, and other, many other studios, which we'll get to. They were in this same site. And my friend Eugene Hill, she is no longer with us. When they were demolishing it in 1962 or something, he, he shot the whole thing before the demolition and after, and during and after. Next. This is where, where D, the birth of a nation first, and then intolerance was shot across the street with a Vista Theater as today, which Tarantino just took over and restored. Look at these sets, 130 feet high. These are real people up here. This was a snapshot taken by some guy during the production. Next. Now, nearby, right behind the, this um, studio, which is KCET, this is Monogram, which later became KCET Studio. And the, all this still exists, and this was all restored by Scientology. Next. This is now the Griffith Studio, back again, but now in 1928. It became Tiffany Stahl. Look at this. All what you just saw there is all stuffed in with buildings. Next. Now, in, at Western Avenue and Sunset was the William Fox Company came from New York as well. And they set up, a, there was already a studio there that was built there in 1915 before they got there. And they eventually took over this, the studio. It's today Target, right? The new Target's there, and I forgot what's on the other side. It was a big box store for a while, I can't remember. Next. And of course, they redid the front to make it nice, span, again, Spanish colonial look. Remember, everything was designed with the Spanish colonial heritage and a revival. Next. This is their open stage in the back. See, with the steel construction, these are the diffusers. Look, uh, all this was all stagecraft from the theater. I'm a theater historian, so they got people from the theater to build their sets and do lighting and do everything. All this was from the theater at first, including the costumes. We're all from costume houses that from the theater. Next. And look at this shot. I love this shot. This is looking down Western Avenue and Sunset in 1921. Wow. This is Hollywood. Nothing was here, just houses. And both sides of the street was the studio where Theta Berra did, uh, you know, Cleopatra and uh, Queen of Sheba, et cetera, et cetera. Next. Now, right in this whole area, in East Hollywood, was the Mabel Norman studio. Mabel Norman worked for... Remember, we, we saw Keystone, Max Sennett? Well, Max Sennett built her this studio, and she had her own productions there. And she did several there. I think she did Mickey there and something else. Next. And there she is. She's uh, one of the first uh, female directors, by the way, besides being an actress. She's the one that taught Charlie Chaplin how to act before the camera. Isn't that interesting? So yes, I was the technical advisor on the film Chaplin. I would say you should review it with Robert Downey Jr. We rebuilt the Keystone Studio, we rebuilt the Chaplin Studio, all in Fillmore, because that still has uh, citrus groves. But I found, I was researching about this character of Mabel Norman teaching him how to act, because he was not, he was a stage actor. You know, the English musical. Next. Now, William S. Hart was the discovery of Thomas Ince out at Inceville, where we were, and you know, we're gonna get to that. And so he took over the studio, and it was the William S. Hart Studio in 1917. That's all still there. It's been stuccoed, and uh, Jesse Robb, a friend of mine who was in the music business, he got it, restored it. He, he rents it out now and whatever. But we, we have a little mini museum in there, and Jean Hilshey built a beautiful model, scale model, 
of the Mabel Norman Hart Studio, which is there on display. Next. And there's William S. Hart and Anna Little. Anna Little was, was one of our first cowgirls. She was very uh, good. I got to meet her. She was 100 years old when I met her. And, you know, all of her photos were stolen over the years by who knows who. So get this. We, about 20 years ago, Hollywood Heritage, we went to go buy the Woodruff collection of Hollywood land from some dealer. And um, the guy said, are you interested in uh, a photo album of some cowboys or something? Said, yeah, it was her album. <laughs> 50 years later or something, I, it comes right to me. How do you like that? <laughs> so anyway, Anna Little was a very important and early Universal. She was at the opening of Universal and did uh, tricks there on her horse. She later told me that later years she got married and she said, I wasn't interested in doing that anymore. Next. Now, Santa Monica had the first studio. This is the Vitagraph studio, 19, came there in 1911, right on Ocean Avenue and 2nd. And this is a rare shot of it. Next. And this is the company. And I, I met, this is Roland Sturgeon, the director. And I met his son and gave me all kinds of stuff and history of everything of the Vitagraph company in Santa Monica. See, I have, I have uh, searched out families for years and years to get all this stuff, they say, do you think you want this? Well, guess what, I just finally re have been reunited with the Horsley family of Nestor Company. And they have his archives, I have part of his archives, and now we're merging them. Um, uh, of course, they will copy everything and it will all go to the Academy Library. I always make sure all this stuff goes there, because when we're not here, I want to make sure it's protected and somebody can research it, right? Next. They remember that you just heard on the news that were fog everywhere. Wasn't that today or yesterday? There was fog everywhere. Well, they couldn't make their pictures out there too much. There's too much fog all the time in Santa Monica. So they moved all the way to East Hollywood, right near the, the Fine Arts Studio and the Charles Ray Studio, to uh, this area, which was owned by the LAUSD at the time, Marshall High property, which is now Prospect and Talmadge. The ABC Television Center is the Vitagraph Studio, today called the Prospect Studio. Next. Now we go back to Hollywood, to the areas where the little farms are. We go to Melrose and Bronson Avenue, which is today Raleigh Studio across from Paramount. And this is the old Fiction Players Studio, which famous players of Adolf Zukor purchased in 1915. And he brought Mary Pickford out, and that's Mary Pickford with Donald Crisp, later became actor, and Alan Dwan, the famous director, and Al Kaufman, the head of the uh, uh, famous players West Coast Studio, and, they, and Mary made a couple films there. Next. And this is the set here. There's Mary, Jack Pickford, her brother, and Alan Dwan, the famous director. Next. See how history comes in. The Lusitania sinking actually had one of the backers of uh, the uh, famous players company of Adolf Zukor. Mark, oh God, what's his name? It just escaped me. He was a theatrical producer. They're two brothers. And he was, this one of the brothers was on the Lusitania and was killed, 1915. So, uh, so Adolf Zukor said, oh my gosh. So he brought all production back to New York because he didn't know where his funding was gonna come from. He did survive and they did come back later. But the, Mr. Kloon of the Kloon Film Company, he was a theater magnate who owned theaters in Pasadena. The one still there is Rialto Theater in Pasadena was his. So anyway, he bought the studio and he says, I'm going to be a producer. My first, film will, my first film in 1915 will be what, everybody? Ramona, of course. Next. And these are the Ramona sets built at Bronson and Melrose. Believe it or not, that's Melrose. There's the studio. And these are the sets of Ramona. And that's Donald Crisp down there. And they were hosting the Archbishop of Mexico who came up to look at the sets. Next. And that's Monroe Salisbury. Wow. And he was with famous players, famous players Lasky. He was with everybody. And at the barn at the Hollywood Studio Museum, Hollywood Heritage Museum, excuse me, uh, we have a beautiful portrait of him there. But he was an actor who was forgotten, but it was very important in his day. And he looks this way because the Ramona story is a tragedy. Next. And little Anne Dvorak, the famous actress in later years, was one of the kids. She was the main kid, actually, in the film, shot at Rancho Camulos, where Mary Pickford was. Next. 
Now, the studio it, during wor World War I is coming, 1917. So William H. William H. Clune leased it out to a company called Peralta Pictures, who had three major units shooting at the time uh, into the war. They're shooting about pre-World War I pictures. And um, that's, um, William, that's Robert Brunton. Robert Brunton was a stage uh, director, stage producer, and a, a man knew everything about stage work and all, and he produced all these films and ran uh, the studios. And uh, Bessie Barriscale, I know you all know who she is, big star at the time, right? And, um, and directors, we have Oscar Opfel, he was the co-director with Cecil B. DeMille on The Squaw Man. And we have Al Green right there, Reginald Barker, who later was at MGM, Donald Crisp, who directed Douglas Fairbanks. And oh, look at all the people here, the cameramen. This picture came from <coughs> Wallace Worsley. There he is. He was director of Hunchback of Notre Dame. His son found this shot on the floor in the garage. <laughs> and I found it and went, oh my god, what if I wasn't there? It would have been thrown away. Next. Finally, in 1919, right after World War I, Douglas Fairbanks leases the studio from William H. Clune to produce his several films that he shot. Next. And of course, Charlie Chaplin and Mary Pickford visited him at the studio. That's his dressing room building. It's still there on the lot. Next. And look at this great shot. Isn't this incredible? This is Melrose and Bronson. And there is the stage, the one big stage, dressing rooms, back lot sets. And, uh, and that's the administration, set building across the street. There's Robert Brunton moved across the street with Peralta and, and started that studio there. Next. And he did the Three Musketeers there, the Mark of Zorro there, and, and about five other pictures there before Mr. Clune would not sell him the studio. So he had to move to West Hollywood. We'll get to that. Next. Robert Brunton across the street. Next. He leased it out to Ruth Rowland, who did uh, serials. Look, isn't this a great shot? They're all in these costumes, clown costumes. <laughs> Next, Mary Pickford used that when she was independent, before United Artists was born, pretty much. Uh, this is 1921, but many of her films be, were other contracts with First National, then eventually United Artists, because it was Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, D.W. Griffith, and Charlie Chaplin that started United Artists in 1919, formed at the Clune studio and at the Charlie Chaplin studio. Eventually, uh, they started making films for their own company later. Le next. And there it is. Look at that. That's Melrose and Bronson. This is today Paramount. And right here is the famous uh, Hollywood Cemetery, opened up in 1899. That's something? And that's the Brunton studio. Look how big it is. So some of these buildings are still there, which I have documented for Paramount. Next. Um, Doug Fairbanks was visiting Mary at the Brunton studio. He was doing Three Musketeers, and she was doing Little Lord Fauntleroy. <laughs> Next. The uh, studio became the tech art studio in the early days of sound, and later became, um, uh, and during TV years where Have Gun Will Travel, Gunsmoke, all these pilots were first started. When they became uh, uh, successful, they moved on. Next. They did the second Ramona picture there, third, excuse me, Ramona picture there in 1928 with Dolores Del Rio, Warner Baxter. Next. Now guess who else was there? Roy Disney was there at the studio. Why? He had a sound unit. He had a special unit called Cinephone, and, that, and Roy and Walt Disney had their early sound units, and they were located at the uh, Clune studio for a while, and this is the sound truck, and that's Roy. Next. Now. Clune wouldn't sell the studio, right, to uh, Doug Fairbanks. So Doug Fairbanks then and Mary uh, moved to a little studio in West Hollywood near La Brea, and which is now Formosa, called the Hampton Studio. And they formed the Pickford Fairbanks Studio there in 1922. Next. And there's the front. And those are the sets for Robin Hood. That was his famous film in 1922. The set stood about 100 feet high. When, when uh, Alan Dwan, the same Alan Dwan that you saw earlier, showed him the set, said, you're going to jump off that parapet and you're going to do it. He says, the hell am I going to do that? <laughs> so he designed, so Alan Dwan designed special effects like little s ramps and little slides so it would look like he's jumping off. Okay, next. <laughs> look at this shot. That's La Brea. 
at Santa Monica Boulevard, 1922. There's the studio, there's the Robin Hood sets. And look at the streams. See these streams and rivers running all over the place? So at the studio one year, years ago, they said, our, our basements are always flooded. What's going on? I said, because there's a river under the studio. They didn't know that. So they, they finally had to dig it out, put, put them in concrete so there was, the whole studio wouldn't sink in one day. Next. It became the Samuel, United Artists Studio, then the Samuel Goldwyn Studio, and sold eventually to Warner Hollywood, which had it for years and years, and now it's an independent studio called The Lot. <laughs> I don't like that name. Next. This is a great shot of it. Taken 1949. This is Santa Monica. There's the Brea right up here. There's that giant gas thing there. Can you imagine that? Oh, God, they had to shoot around it. You know, you don't see this in the background. Eventually, it was removed. And uh, the Formosa Cafe is right there. There it is. It wasn't called the Formosa Cafe. It was called the Red Post. Why? This is Route 66 into Santa Monica, Barney's Beanery. These were roadhouses for the railroad workers and the, and the truckers and all this stuff. See how the history of Los Angeles, the, the cities and everything are all connected with the film industry in one way or another. Next. This is the Lincoln Motion Picture Company of Noble Johnson and his brother George. They came from um, the Midwest somewhere, Illinois somewhere. Anyway, they came here to, and set up shop because uh, Noble Johnson was doing real well uh, being uh, an actor. His best friend was Lon Chaney Sr. They learned together. They pioneered makeup effects, L Noble and Lon Chaney. Lon Chaney became famous and everything because Noble was black man, right? But he looked white. He could look anything. So they would change themselves into any character, any, any ethnic group, and they got work. And he worked on almost 400 and something films. He was the, he was the king of Skull Island in King Kong, if you remember that. But he was in many other ones that you would never know. Next. That was their studio in Sautel, as you saw. Sautel, Westwood you know, area. Uh, this is their advertising. And you see, there were many black uh, uh, theaters in the South because uh, they, wouldn't, they couldn't show any of their films in white theaters, right? So he said, wow, what a market. So he made films, like later on, his assistant was Oscar Micheaux. Oscar Micheaux had his own film company. They were all making films for the uh, market in the South. But guess what? P people like Noble Johnson and Oscar actually had crossover <coughs> movies. So white people went to see their movies as well. And it started to leave the South and go everywhere. So it's very interesting history in that whole area. Next. And this is them. This is, the, this is uh, Beulah Hall. Noble Johnson and George Johnson, and um, and one of the finance uh, and they were financed by uh, by mostly Jews, of course. The Jewish companies <laughs> financed them, so it's very interesting how independent companies, these independents, Carl Lemley, all of them were all told, no, you can't do this, you can't rent this, you can't show your films, you can't. What did they do? They started their own companies and did it anyway. <laughs> this is the entrepreneurial. Spirit, thank you very much, of all of these independents. There was actually a Chinese-American company in San Francisco. There was also, um, God, what are the others? Um, there were actually Yiddish film companies, would you believe that? <laughs> Metro Studios, with uh, Marcus Lowe and everything, New York came out, 1915, settled here at Eleanor and Lillian Way in Hollywood, right by Santa Monica Boulevard, next. Became Metro Studios, right here, this is Cole. And, and Coenga and Vine Street right here and Romaine Street right here. And there is their first studio right here. Later, this was given over to uh, Buster Keaton. And Buster Keaton's studio was there. And of course, the Metro Studio grew and grew. Next. And this is the beautiful administration building on Romaine Street. And this is where Valentino, Nazimova, Jackie Coogan, all were born at this studio. And then by 1924, as we all know with Culver City history, they literally took apart all these stages and stuff and moved them here to the, uh, to the lot, which we'll get to in a minute. So you see everything's moving around, very fluid. Next, Hal Roach Company started as the Roland Film Company, downtown LA, 1914. Now Hal Roach and Harold Lloyd were extra actors. They were cavalry 
officers riding horses at Universal Studios in 1913. And I found a picture. Remember that panorama I just saw? There's another one that goes with that that shows all everybody out there at the ranch. And there's a horse group there. If you look closely, there's Hal and there's Harold Lloyd. So I blew that up and showed that to Hal Roach. And he almost flipped because he, he wasn't sure he was there because everybody said uh, they weren't sure he was there. I found proof he was there. So anyway, they made their first films at the Bradbury Mansion in downtown L.A., which was a movie studio in 1914. You see how the history of Los Angeles is interconnecting. They not only shot on location, they used historical places as studios. Next. Hell Road Studio was built on the site of the Henry Learman Comedy Studio. Remember Henry Learman all the way back to Keystone, all those days? So Henry Learman built his studio, and then he went on to Fox to do the Fox comedies. Hal Roach took over his studio, rebuilt this in 1921. Next. And this is the first stage, the first enclosed stage, and that is Harold Lloyd and Hal Roach standing on the stage for the first time. Next. Of course, Laurel and Hardy with Hal visiting. Next. And we have uh, our gang starting there with Sun Sunshine Sammy. I have to plug my podcasts now. They're short podcasts. Just go online, The History of Hollywood with Mark Wanamaker or vice versa. And I do these podcasts 10 minutes to uh, 20 minutes long on forgotten people of the film industry. Sunshine Sammy was the first black child star. And Hell Road started him. And I, I found a picture of the signing a ceremony of the contract in Hell Road's office. And there is Sammy's father sitting in the back crying. Next. See that shot? Oh, God. It's emotional. Here's the Selig Zoo Studio in Lincoln Park. Selig, remember the first studio and everything? He opened up a studio zoo. He bought a zoo. And then uh, Horsley bought the Bostock Animal Zoos. They both had studio zoos. Horsley's was on Washington, uh, Washington Boulevard in downtown, which was near Washington Park, which was baseball fields and all this stuff in the 19th century. And, and um, Selig opened up his at Mission Road, right next to Lincoln Park. Next. This is the back lot of that studio that was up there on Mission Road. I did a History Detectives, I hope you saw it, years ago, and we covered the lost studio of the Selig Zoo studio. By the way, all the animals eventually ended up in the first Los Angeles Zoo. Next. Look at that. This is, what, this is Mission Boulevard. There's Lincoln Park right here. This is today called Selig Place. And there's that entryway that you just saw with all the animals. Well, we found many of those concrete animals. They've been saved, restored by the LA Zoo, but they have no money to put them up yet. <laughs> They've been sitting in storage all these years now. Next. This is what they shot there. The Warner Brothers used it. Uh, many people used the Sealy Studio Zoo as their studio locations. Next. Uh, here we're getting there. We're getting near the end now. Wow, look at that, Topanga. Innsville is only 12 and a half miles. <laughs> Santa Monica is 16 miles. Calabasas is only, so this is way up near Malibu. Next. And there we have Innsville. This is where the Bison Film Company went in 1911. They came here to Pacific Palisades, slash Santa Monica, slash Topanga Canyon, Topanga State uh, uh, Park, and right near Leo Carrillo Beach, right? I say Leo Carrillo, why? Because there was a, it's called Star Hollywood, Star of Hollywood Radio, and they filmed it. It was a newsreel, just like Entertainment Tonight. And uh, Pat O'Brien was the host, and Leo Carrillo was introduced. So he says, here is Leo Carrillo. <laughs> so Le Leo Carrillo comes up, and he goes, takes the mic from him, he goes, it's Leo Carrillo. <laughs> Everybody laughed, you know. So he was very proud of this, of course. Anyway, there's Innsville. It all was started by Thomas Inns and the Bison Film Company. Bison was then eventually merged with Universal and lost, and it became other brands that they made. Next. So this is an advertisement, 1915. There's Tom Inns directing. And these are the different areas of Innsville. Backlot sets here, interiors of the stage. This is the prop department that of course some people in this audience would be interested in. 
<laughs> All right, anyway, um, there's the armory. They had an armory in there because they had many be pictures. They did Gettysburg there. They had all kinds of giant pictures, thousands of people using sh rifles and guns. And remember, you just heard recently about the Baldwin case. Now, Hope and her, and her father were armorers, of course, because they were prop people. Do you know in the history of the film industry, all the way back to 1903, <laughs> with the great train robbery and George Barnes shooting the gun straight at the audience that you might have seen in films. Do you know that there was a, hardly anybody, there was a few times there was an accident, some guy shot at his hand or his foot, but that was so rare. Can you imagine the thousands of films? John Hexum shot himself by accident. Brandon. Brandon Lee shot himself by accident, and now this. Here at Innsville, there's a sign, I found it. And it says when, you, when they park their horses there and <laughs> go into the armory, make sure they say that uh, check in your guns. And check, when you check out your guns, you have to check your guns. See what I mean? Next. This is right on the Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, Gladstones is right here. <laughs> and look what's going on, all these events and, and all these things going on in Innsville. Next. This is the Bronco Film Company. This is one of the, the, uh, the companies of, they did different brands. This was Indians and Cowboys. And guess who I found in the shot? My girlfriend, Jane Bernudi, is right there. <laughs> and get this, uh, I had a friend that, that found a, the memoirs and photograph albums and everything of Edward Bernudi. Now, he died, my friend, it was Bob Burchard, some of you knew him. I got his stuff, and I was looking. So I got a call from the Fort Worth Museum, the Cowgirl Hall of Fame, looking for pictures or information of Jane Bernudi. I said, who's that? Jane Bern but then I remembered I have this card. It's a club card from Innsville Association, 1935, Ed Bernudi on it. I went, oh my god. So then I went and searched, found the memoirs of Ed Bernudi. When they first came out, he was the younger brother of Jane. They came here in 1910 from Nebraska or Oklahoma or who knows where, I forgot. And they, stay, they were with the Miller Brothers 101 Wild West Show, which, which was performing in Venice, California. Yes, Jill. Jill is here from the Venice Historical. So there she is right there. All right. They stayed at the St. Mark's Hotel, 1910. Remember, it was just built, when it was built? 1908, right? Something like that, Jill? Something like that. And um, they took the stagecoach, the Innsville stagecoach, up to Innsville. It was a five and a half mile trip. And he describes the whole trip in his memoirs, going past Santa Monica Canyon. What a beautiful canyon, he says, and all this stuff. And they go to there, and it took so long. So after a year or so, this was impossible. And they started to build uh, facilities for people to live at Innsville. All the Indians had their own teepees there, which were also livable, but they were also used in the films. So there's Jane right there. There's all the, these are, um, these are, um, oh God, what's Sioux Tribe? There are several Sioux Tribes. There were two or three Sioux Tribes at Innsville at the time. Next. There's Tom Ince directing Civilization. This is right before World War I. They were making anti-war films at the time, and then when Woodrow Wilson got us into the war, they made pro-war films. But this is Ince making Civilization. This is the, the, the Congress of the United States, built at Innsville. Next. Finally, William S. Hart is a discovery of Thomas Ince. He's a stage actor from New York, played Ben-Hur on the stage came out to do a play here and knew his friend Tom was here in Innsville, came out for a visit, saw everything, and so Ince introduced them to the Sioux tribes, and all of a sudden, William S. Hart's speaking Sioux language and sign language with them. He said, how do you know this? He says, I grew up, my father was a trader with the Indians, I learned the languages. He says, I have to make you a Western star. Well, I don't like riding horses particularly. Well, it, he got him Fritz the horse, which is a little tiny horse, and that started the career of William S. Hart. Isn't that interesting? So he took over the Inn studio before he moved to East Hollywood, which we just saw. Next. Finally, Culver City. Ince moves out of Inceville to Culver City, opens up the Triangle Inn Studios, which later became MGM, of course. This is the inaugural shot. Look at this great shot. 1916, they made a film called The Glass Bullet. And it's a mystery, right? But they were just painting the buildings here. The film exists, it's in excellent condition. It shows ladders up on Washington Boulevard for the painters. They use the ladders, it shows the guy climbing up the ladder. 
They put the cameras on the roof and they pan around all of Culver City in the film showing the studio in 1916 and it exists on film. Next. This is the construction of that dressing room and writer's building. Next. Thomason's outside shooting and this is the last shot bringing us back to Culver City and Thomas Ince. So now the quiz will begin <laughs> in about 10 minutes intermission. Thank you. OK, we'll have questions, of course, right? Right, Hope, we have questions, right? Do we have questions? Time? Yeah, you can stand up and whatever and rest. Any questions right away? Go. Um, how long was the poverty road before they started making money and wealth? Good, good, great question. You saw it started pretty much, not with the Nestor Company, there was no poverty road yet. It all started when Horsley built all of that, all those buildings there with the Horsley Labs, 1919. And right when Columbia took over all of that, 1926 and 7. So how many years is that? 1919, 1926. Yeah. And, or they merged. Columbia became, uh, Will Nat and all those little companies became Columbia. Warner Brothers had other brands, became Warner Brothers. That's how it all happened, merging. <laughs>